And welcome into Facebook Live. I'm Stan the Fan with a birthday edition of Facebook Live, uh, Pressbox Live on Facebook Live. Stan the Fan along with my co-host Gary Stein. Everybody knows Terry Hazeltine, but Terry, raise your hand for just a second. And then our other guests tonight to talk World Cup soccer and the bid for Maryland to host a game during the 2026 World Cup are Bumi Janadu. Bumi, will you wave your hand so everybody knows which guy is Bumi? Uh, and I'm ignoring the fact that everybody's names are on the screen. And Aguchi away you and uh, on way you. Uh, okay. You did. You did. Took to take the mute off of it. <clears throat> Thank you, gentlemen, for all joining us, and we've got a, a lot of exciting stuff to talk about tonight. You know, it's funny. I told a couple of people today that I was going to be talking, the you know, about this World Cup, and they said, "Why aren't you talking football?" And I said, "We are talking football. We're talking mm -hmm. international football. F U T B O L. We're talking about the World Cup bid uh, effort by the state of Maryland." Uh, with Terry Hazeltine kind of heading up that bid as executive director of Maryland Sports. And Terry, I'm going to start with you, and I want to have an interactive get-together get with you guys. But I'm always amazed, and I remember like 20 years ago, maybe 25 years ago, when Clarence Bishop and Dan Knais were trying to work on getting Maryland involved with the Olympics, the U.S. bid for an Olympics. and I was interviewing them like 1995 and it was for like the 2012 or 16 Olympics or something yeah. like that. This is the 2026 World Cup. When is the first date that you can remember that you did some type of work on this bid to help the United States get involved in this World Cup? Well, it, it's going to go back a while because there's a couple of reiterations of how we got to today. You know, most people remember that the United States put in a solo bid to go after the 18 and 22 World Cup. Right. And so when we did the Chelsea AC Milan match in 2009 was where we really put our anchor in the ground and said, you know, we're going after international soccer. We're going to connect with a lot of really great people across the globe and start bringing it to the state of Maryland and M&T Bank Stadium on a more regular basis. It was that match that we you know, put 72,000 people in a 71,000 seat stadium still the largest sporting event in M&T Bank Stadium history um, to watch AC Milan and Chelsea play um, a really exciting, you know, soccer friendly um, here in the state. It was that night that the um, previous um, head of FIFA was in New York City and saw um, how full our stadium was, how electric it was. and said that city and that stadium need to be a part of the U.S. Um, efforts to secure a World Cup in the future. So that's really what started the whole process. We went through, obviously, the 18 and 22, the United States didn't win the bid, but it kept us relevant and it kept us present front of mind. And so back in 2017, when the United States, Canada and Mexico made the decision that they were going to pursue this as a North American bid, um, John Christick, who was heading the United bid effort, called me and said, are you in? And I said, hell yes, we're in. And we're going to formulate a team and we're going to go after this thing hard and we're going to, you know, create a great team, bring in some really great people, two of them here on the call with us today, and good partners with the two of you who are you know, conducting this uh, conversation this evening. And we started the process. The North American bid one was successful for 2026. The United Bid Committee took a little hiatus as some things transitioned in leadership at U.S. Soccer and the like, and now being run by U.S. Soccer. And about a, um, about a year and a half ago was in earnest where we started to really have to start putting, you know, our, our minds together, you know, formulating the team, you know, creating the structure in place and, and building the model so that we can knock out seven other cities to make sure that we're a top 10 contender to host matches in 2026 in the United All States. Right. I've got one more for you before we involve the rest of the panel. And that is, if you go back to the decision for this to be an historic um, a World Cup in 2026, it is hosted by three nations, what was the main reason that it, it felt necessary to, to lump everybody together to make this effort? Because the, the amount of money, it's staggering how much money the World Cup means to one country. Why have it sort of dispersed between three countries? 
I, I think a lot of that, um, and, and Boomi can probably jump in as can Gucci on this one. I think there was some movement in FIFA uh, about bringing the confederations together and uniting them um, so that there can be some continuity, uh, making sure in our case it's CONCACAF, you know, everybody got a chance to play a role in delivering the, the content, delivering the leadership and, and it being more of a unifying. The, the, the emphasis behind this bit is you know, the word united, you know, uniting people, uniting, you know, constituents, uniting organizations. I think people in their internal metrics was saw that bringing nations and bringing um, the confederations together you know, had a stronger approach to delivering a world-class bid and opportunity for, for FIFA and the World Cup and the fan experience as you expand to a 48-team tournament come 2026. So I mm -hmm. think some internal stuff going on with FIFA and in concert with the movement to unite, you know, through the game and you know, making a collective whole win for a confederation versus just one nation over another. United is a much better word than lumping together. Gary, you got <laughs> the next couple of questions. Yeah. yeah. Well, at, at the same time, let me kind of piggyback on that. I'm going to address this one to Boomi. Boomi, you're probably very well aware this isn't the first time that FIFA awarded a cup to more than one nation. Back in 2002, South Korea and Japan shared it, not three countries, but two <laughs> countries. But after that, FIFA really for many years didn't want a joint uh, combination between more than you know more than one country. Uh, they didn't want to have two countries do it, and specific, and especially not three. What do you think changed FIFA's mind over the last few years? Was it the U.S. Canada Mexico bid, or was it something else that allowed U.S. Canada and Mexico to kind of make the bid? Uh, well, Gary, thanks for that question. It was uh, uh, FIFA was going through a reformed uh, bidding process. And uh, part of the principle of that process was to um, increase the particip participation of uh, diverse communities. And uh, by embracing all the communities, you know, together, you know, it only made sense uh, for a united bid, you know. Um, so when you increase the, the, the countries and the teams, you know, you have to go outside of your perimeter, so to speak. Hence, uh, you know, the, the Canada, Mexico, you know, and the, and the US. So it's, it, it was part of the reform bidding process. Uh, that's why we are here today. Sounds good. And I want to address this one to Oguchi. You know, <laughs> well, here in America, I, I, even though we have the MLS and we have arena soccer and soccer is definitely growing in terms of youth participation. And then as the youth grow older, um, I'm just looking on Wikipedia for a minute here and I'm looking at your experience. You're a local product, actually, from the D.C., Baltimore area. Um, you've played internationally in France. I'm just quoting France, Belgium, England, Italy the Netherlands, Portugal, Spain, the United States, some of the greatest soccer playing countries in the world. We have World Cup champions in that, in that group right there. Can you take us just inside the World Cup for a minute from a player's perspective and kind of give Americans who may not, have, may not remember back in 94 when the World Cup came here, what it's like to play in this event and what this event is like for fans. I mean, for me, because soccer is my life, right? That's my bread and butter. That's my reason for breathing. Um, it's truly hard to quantify really what the experience is like because it's the epitome and it's the, the top of the mountain for any soccer player. Like you want to be able to represent your country at the highest stage at a World Cup. And that is essentially what any professional soccer player aspires to achieve, right? And when you get that opportunity to represent your country, to make yourself among the 20 some best players named in the nation and then play at the highest stage in front of the world because it's truly the most watched sporting event in the world. It, it trumps the Super Bowl, it trumps any kind of American sporting event that we could ever imagine, right. NBA, NFL, et cetera. And to be on a world stage like that, you know, the emotion, the, the passion, um, 
it's 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 truly a, a time where at once every four years the world comes together and everyone's unified for us for a single purpose and there's really no words to kind of explain it so me having participated in two uh the first one in germany and the second in, in south africa from you know and having my family there and it, it was definitely an experience of, of a lifetime and by the way i just wanted to uh i was remiss at the beginning of the show tonight Aguchi is a goodwill ambassador for Maryland uh, in, in its efforts to obtain a World Cup game or become a base camp. And Boomi is a senior advisor to Maryland's World Cup bid. Boomi and Terry, I wanted to ask you in reading some bio information on Boomi, I came across some articles about the connection in where certain, uh, you know, Baltimore and, and African, different countries in Africa are trying to kind of team up both in an economic, for economic reasons and also for reasons about possibly moving the needle on getting Baltimore to be able to host a game. Could you address that? How did, uh, that, come, how did that come about? Well, let me set the stage and then I'll let, uh, you know, Boomy hit it out of the park. Because um, I know you're a baseball fan, Stan. Um, so... <laughs> Back about several years ago, um, when we were going through the process, a, a gentleman by the name of Bumi Janata reached out to me and said, Terry, um, I have a methodology that I think could really help set you apart from your competitors. And I, I want to chat with you for a little bit. Do you mind taking the call? And so I took the call um, with, with Bumi. He, he set a very robust agenda for the call. He impressed me at a lot of levels because you started seeing the connections across a lot of different parallels of where Boomi's expertise and um, his background could be really helpful to us. Um, he even said to me, Terry, you're going to take a risk with me. And I said, Boomi, if you lead me down a good path, I'm going to stick with you and we're going to stay together. And he has done everything and then some um, in support of this World Cup bid effort. And he's done it with candor. He's done it with sincerity, but what he's done it with most is he's put his, what he said he's going to do in words, he's put into action and he's opened doors and created, you know, canals for us to, to drive through. And he's really created a really good environment for us. And I'm very proud to say that he's a friend, but I'm also very proud to say that he's a part of our bid. And, and because of him, we're doing some really unique things that probably none of our competitors said are doing. So boom, I said boom, the stage, now boom. Yeah, boom. Let me just ask you, first of all, what uh, attracted you to Terry and Baltimore and Maryland's bid as part of this that you reached out to him? I'm assuming you didn't reach out to Dallas and L.A. and New York. You reached out to Terry for a reason. OK, <clears throat> two things attracted me. Um, one, uh, Baltimore is the city of the underdog. That's one. And two, uh, Baltimore, Maryland was the only city um, that checked all the boxes, you know, uh, for all the uh, prerequisites for um, uh, for um, the potential of winning a bid. They're the only ones that checked all the boxes. Um, but more important for me was the the DNA of the underdog. Um, you know, we went through a period uh, last year of um, COVID, you know, taking the whole sports industry, you know, the, glo the global community by storm. Right. And uh, one of the biggest, uh, the hardest hitting in the, um, uh, in industries was the sports uh, tourism. And, um, you know, a lot of... Uh, you know, leadership in different states around the world and, and the US, uh, they, nobody had any type of answer, you know, and for us, we, you know, I saw that bringing the World Cup to Baltimore, Maryland, it was in a way a different type of stimulus package, you know, outside of the direct stimulus package. But, you know, um, if I'm a taxi driver, if I'm a Uber driver, if I'm a if I'm a uh, hotelier, 
you know, here's an opportunity to walk on the world, you know, and be able to bring back some of those dollars, you know, into that community. And uh, Baltimore, Maryland was the only city out of all the other cities that were really, that really started pursuing, you know, their bid for the World Cup, you know, during, you know, during this uh, season of, um, of COVID. Everybody else was, you know, they were up in the air, you know, but Baltimore saw this as an opportunity, you know, and it was just the timing of, you know, meeting with Terry and saying, hey, look, Terry, this is our opportunity to sneak in under the radar, you know, and really do those things while the other uh, big cities, you know, that are complacent as, as sleeping, you know, we can actually, you know, take, uh, take the ball by the by the horns and start planning ahead of time. So when you say, Boomy, that it, it Baltimore checked all the boxes, can you be more specific to us and the people viewing this as to what impressed you about Baltimore more specifically? Okay, so um, in the history of um, uh, FIFA World Cups and, and bids, um, downtown stadiums win, win bids. Okay. And uh, the fact that uh, uh, Baltimore, Maryland's uh, stadium is right in the nerve and the nucleus of downtown, you know, and if you look at that, if you look at it in a concentric circle, um, you know, outside of the stadium, you have, you know, uh, the Northeast Corridor, which is the DMV, Washington, D.C., um, Virginia, you know that corridor. So if I was a if I was a fan uh, coming in from Holland, for instance, right. um, and I was to travel into the U into the U uh, to Maryland at Washington, you know, the, if I was to get a, a airfare, it would be cheaper for me to fly to Maryland because you know um, Washington D.C. is a is a hot destination in terms of and it has one airport, but in Baltimore, Maryland, you know, the, the, you, have, you have three airports, you know, um, it's right next door to the Capitol, you know, it's right there in the DMV. You have a lot of hotels within, you know, within a 50 mile r uh, radius, you know, they just do, there's just a lot of things going on in uh, Baltimore, you know, that it, it is, it, if, if there's a if there's a city that deserves to be given an opportunity to change the economic future of that city, Baltimore, Maryland deserves it. Um, why? Because you know it's gone through a whole lot of stuff. And what FIFA's main goal is, it, the purpose of FIFA, and um, is to promote football in every nook and cranny and every community not just locally, nationally, but globally, okay? And Baltimore, Maryland, they've never, um, they've never um, had a Super Bowl, okay? They've won Super Bowls as underdogs, right. okay? They've never hosted a, a major sporting event. And here is an underdog saying, look, we, we, can, we can host it. We, we have everything, okay? So all you have to do is just give us that opportunity and we can, we'll show you that we can be, you know, the host with the most. There, go ahead. So Stanley, if I could get three questions in here because I've yep, got one go for everybody. Yep. Boomy, on that note that you just mentioned, you kind of touched on it. I, I have a quote here that you, uh, that you have, that you've made. Uh, I'm gonna read it for a minute and I want you to, to explain it. You, your quote is hosting World Cup games in Baltimore, Maryland allows both the state and the governing body to fulfill its legacy promise a much needed sporting stimulus package and an inspiration for the coming out for the next Mia Hamm, Lionel Messi, Gordon Banks, et cetera, right here in Maryland. What did you mean by the hosting World Cup games in Baltimore allows both the state and the governing body to fulfill its legacy promise? All right, so legacy, the, leg, the legacy of any of any of the FIFA World Cups is always to leave something Im impactful, you know. Um, whether it's you know um, a, a, um, 
different uh, international sporting programs with uh, youth and, and soccer development. Um, so uh, with, with touching those communities, with the different communities, the different diverse communities, you know, you, you don't just come in and host the games, you, you come in, make an impact, but there's a, there's a continuity. So that continuity is the opportunity, you know, for both the governing body and the, the state, you know, to continue with the, with the, you know, with other different sporting events. So for instance, they give uh, Baltimore, Maryland wins the bid, is one of the uh, uh, cities that is uh, elected. Uh, to uh, to host uh, matches, okay. Right after the World Cup, automatically, you know, we can leverage that to bid for other major sporting events. You know, in soccer, uh, in any of the rectangular sports. You know, if there's a World Cup rugby in the U.S., automatically, you know, it's it's already in the DNA of Maryland. Uh, to say, hey, we hosted the biggest world, uh, sporting events in, in the world. Now rugby is, is a no-brainer for, for us. So that's the type of legacy, you know, that I'm talking about. It's it's not just a, a um, it's an intrinsic value le legacy and also a tangible legacy that we can all see. Okay, uh, excellent. And, and Carrie, if I may hear, and I, correct me if my numbers are not accurate, but I believe right now the situation is there are 17 cities in the USA that are bidding for 10 spots, basically. Baltimore would like to get one of those 10 spots. Mm -hmm. I took a look at the map this morning and just doing some quick math here. And obviously, as you know, there's a concentration of cities up and down the East Coast. From Boston down to DC, there are five cities, including Boston, New York, Philly, Baltimore, DC that are all 490 miles apart from top to bottom. That's a very large concentration in a small mileage part. Mm -hmm. I look around the map and there's no other concentration like that around the country. You've got LA, San Francisco, you've got Houston, Dallas, you know, you've got Atlanta, Orlando, Orlando, Miami, I get that, but not like this. Yep. So my question to you is, is, does that help you? Does that hurt you? Is that a factor at all? Uh, to me, it's, it's a very helpful component. You know, when the bid was submitted, they, they looked at New York City as the championship sites. Um, the fact that you can get up and down the I-95 corridor, be on an Amtrak train, you can be on an air flight that's less than an hour, you can be on a boat, you can get to Baltimore in any mode of transportation that's out there under the sun. Um, and because of that and the logistics of that, I think you're going to see some potential potting. Um, and whether that's a you know pool play to knock out early knockout rounds to the championship site, you know, I think and Gucci can probably speak to this better than I can, but you know, condensing travel portfolios for the teams and the athletes, I think is is it's helpful when you're you know putting on an event of this magnitude because the last thing you want to do is put wear and tear on the performers um, and if you have to when you start getting into knockout rounds and the like and you're taking a team from the east coast and flying them out to the west coast you know that day of travel is wear and tear on the athlete and and the like also when you're talking about basing fan base and you're talking about you know potentially being the home of to a country all 30 plus days of the tournament and their fans can get up and down the eastern seaboard and quick travel like i mentioned amtrak you know, to flights, to boats, you know, and bus. You can use all those things. So you can create a really dense portfolio of a number of teams calling the East Coast region home and engaging the fan fest. So we're all, it actually is a, a pro that we might all work in concert with one another's on how we're delivering the World Cup. So there's continuity between one site to the, the next. And like I said, we're taking care of the fan base in concert with that. And then to add to that, I think, and like I said, I'll, I'll jump, you hand it off to the Gucci here, but to me, it seems to be something that would be more beneficial to the athlete, not having to have the wear and tear of being on four or five hour flights in between matches and the like. So Gucci, your thoughts on that? I mean, yeah, obviously for a player, you'd, you'd want to be involved in the least possible distance of traveling between games, right? 
Um, if I had the, the option of going from Baltimore to New York in between games, as opposed to going from Baltimore to uh, California or more even anywhere in Mexico, like it's right there. It's easy. The rest uh, between games, the travel, it all has wear and tear and affects performance. So um, the least uh, distance that you can do as a player or as a team or as a coach, you're going to try to, to capture that for sure. And if I could slip one more in for, uh, for Aguchi, you know, you've played all over the world, as we documented, uh, you played in World Cups, uh, et cetera. What I find interesting, though, most interesting is your local, uh, you, you know, D.C., Baltimore, you played at Sherwood High School, uh, you've grown up in this area. So you were a youth soccer participant in this area before you became a professional soccer player in the world. Right. And one of the things that Boomi and Terry were both talking about was kind of our culture here in the mid-Atlantic area of soccer, how you, you have, what youth participation is like, how we, our relationship with soccer, the diversity of our communities. Growing up in that, can you speak to that a little bit? It's probably something that you talk about being a, an ambassador, but I'm just wondering from your perspective about the diversity and the culture of the mid-Atlantic Baltimore, Washington, D.C. soccer fan. Well, yeah, I will say, I'm not going to give my age, but the youth level is completely different than it was when I was <laughs> playing and growing up, right? But I think one thing that has not changed and probably has grown and progressed on is the level of importance of soccer. Um, there's, and I think Bloomy spoke about it, there's such a diverse culture within the DMV area. Um, and so me being... Um, offspring of immigrants my parents came here from Nigeria you know soccer was always in my blood so there's there's the Latino influence there's African influence you have the Caribbean influence as well from all over and so you know for me to hone in and kind of follow the path of soccer was almost natural um, because it was you know you in the winter time you played indoor in the springtime you you play uh, outdoor you played high school, you played club, you played rec, rec league. It was all of those things uh, back in the day. So for me, it was almost natural. Um, all my friends were doing it. Um, and it was at the time that soccer was getting more popularity, um, not necessarily on the professional side, but definitely in the youth side. Um, and a lot of my friends were doing it. And that's actually how I got into soccer. My, my friends were doing it. And I was like, okay, I want to, I want to do what my friends are doing. Mm. And, uh, it ended up being very lucrative and, and, and the right path for me uh, by chance. So yeah, for me, it's, I would love to be able to, to jumpstart and spark that interest in the game like I had when I was younger to the next generation, right? And I remember when I was maybe 12, 13 years old watching the 94 World Cup and seeing, you know, not only um, Team USA, but the Nigerian Super Eagles. And I was like, wow, this is, this is soccer, right? And it's in, it's in the country I'm living in. And it was almost surreal uh, as a young player. Cause I, at that point, I did, had no idea that I could be a professional. Right. And I was like, okay, so these guys are playing at this stage. What do I have to do to get there as well? Um, and obviously the, the, you know, there's a lot of other factors that go into being successful and getting the opportunities that I had. But, you know, I would say that the 94 World Cup was the first thing that opened my eyes to what, mm. what, what the possibility for me could be like in the future. And, you know, 2026 is going to spark a lot of interests for another generation of youngsters that probably wouldn't have had the interest had it not been hosted in America. My next question is actually for Terry, but I wanted to make sure I, I'm quoting Boomy right. Uh, Boomy, you said that Baltimore has been through a lot and deserves the chance to, to sort of at, at this life altering money that the World Cup would mean. Did I, am I quoting that correctly? Uh, yes, you are. Okay. Terry, what kind of money are we talking about for Baltimore or, or the state of Maryland? if they get a game, and then I want to transition to talk about if we would fail to get a game, the next best path would be this sort of base camp. And then I had a question about the base camps with the Gucci. Um, so we're talking if matches are held in 
in, in M and T, and I should say when matches are held in M and T. I like that. Uh, when 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 uh, we're talking about a economic stimulus of about four hundred to six hundred million dollars of direct spending in in Maryland's economy over the period of time um, that the that the games the matches are being played. However, you got to add on some incremental growth to that number because you're talking about 30 plus days of activation in the marketplace because there's an obligation to host a fan fest that has to be live and actionable during um, the entirety of the events. You know, so there's an additional way to you know engage fans, engage tourists and, and spectators alike when matches aren't being played. So you have that right at the at the core of some additional activity. Um, we also know that if you're hosting matches, there are going to be fan bases that are going to naturally migrate to where matches are being played, and they're going to call it their home. And, you know, we hope that we have that experience of welcoming, you know, hundreds of thousands of folks to call Baltimore, Maryland, and the DMV area home during the entirety of the World Cup, which means that they're going to be in our bars and our restaurants, they're going to be in our hotels, they're going to be walking our streets, they're going to be investing in the marketplace. And it's also our chance during this time to really show to the world that one, we have great commerce. We have one of the best ports in the world, especially on the Eastern seaboard of the United States. You know, we have a can-do mentality and attitude. And even if we don't win matches, we can still extend that attitude to the world. And, you know, teams like Brazil or a team like France or whatever, you know, if assigned, they might be assigned to, to Maryland as their base camp which means that every time that after they play, they got to come back in the market to train. Yeah. So they actually, you know, take up, you know, the residency at a hotel, you know, it's where they leave the gear. Something I learned from Gucci on a previous call. This is where they leave. That's where their apartment is basically. Yeah. And they're not playing. So there are things you can win through not hosting matches. You know, the, the big cherry on the top of the entire Sunday is hosting matches, but we so can have victories other ways. So hosting matches, I just want to be clear before I move to the base camp concept. Hosting, when we, we talk about if Baltimore would get a, a game, is it a, a series of matches, the, the knockout round first, and then a big game? Or the um, knockout round games are what these opportunities are? So based on the bid and how it was submitted to FIFA from the United Big Committee, Baltimore sits in the pool play and the third round and the early knockout rounds. We're, we're lined up in that sequence of activity. We're not the opening round and we're not the, the championship game. Um, those are obviously going to go to more bio, uh, larger media markets because you want to kick it off with a bang and you want to end it with a bang. And, you know, we also know that, um, you know, the media markets in the United States where that is present. But it is, um, it is very significant um, that we could possibly have you know, three to four matches played in the That's Baltimore right. market based on where we're aligned in the sequence of, you know, matches to be played because pool play obviously is a series of matches within a certain cluster. And then, you know, the knockout round is the first movement to eliminating teams out of the process. Um, so usually pool play to an early knockout round, and then, then you're moving on to the quarters and the semis, which are then probably moving on to some of your bigger media markets because, you, you know, pool play – even if you lose, you get to move on because you get to play another day. It's when you start getting in the knockout rounds, it's game played. You win, you move on, you lose, you, you know, you're packing your bag and going back to your home country. So before I ask Aguchi the question about base camp, you know, what it's like and all that, I wanted to ask you, so that number was, if we host games, it's 450 to 600 million. What if we, quote unquote, just got to be a base camp? We talking about two hundred million dollars, or is it all the way down to seventy-five to one hundred million dollars? I think I think if you're going strictly base camp, and you know whether you're, it, and it will go by if you're a base camp with one team, yep. you're probably talking that lower seventy-five to one hundred. Okay. Uh, if you're talking being a base camp for two two teams, potentially three, you're talking probably in excess of the one hundred and fifty to pushing okay. the two hundred. It all depends on how many teams get assigned to your market when you become a base camp. And because the, it's the United States, Mexico, and Canada, you know, and it's 48 teams, if you just look at the totality of it, you know, there's 17 cities vying for 10 spots in the United States. There's three in Mexico and three in Canada. 
you put that together, you got 23 sites, you got 48 teams to disperse. So you look at that, you're saying base camp's probably going to be two to maybe three teams per site. So probably looking in the 150-ish range um, when you talk about being just a base camp. But the other pro to this, you know, Stan and, and Gary, is that if you don't get a match, you might be awarded something else like the annual Congress, you know, one of the big meetings that FIFA has on an annual basis. You know, you might have some other matches that are played because people have to play. There are other factors that might come into play that you might actually get another reward for being a part of the process. And those things will play out as they start eliminating down to who's actually going to get matches. So we're in this to get matches. But at the end of the day, there are other big victories that we can accomplish and achieve beyond the game of soccer and legacy and sustainability and human rights and human trafficking and, and other activities and the like. We can leave Baltimore in a much better place in the state of Maryland the, through the game of soccer in the World Cup on a lot of different platforms that we're working with, you know, Gucci and Boomi on, on developing to ensure that this isn't just about, you know, a bid for matches. It's a bid that hopefully we're setting the tonality for a, a future legacy growth of the game and leaving a Baltimore in the state of Maryland a better place because we went after this activity and we set in the foundation today. So kids in 26 and 36 and 46, you know, live, you know, in a better place because we helped create a legacy of leave behind because we did this activity. Gucci, that brings me back to you about the base camp. You've played in it. You've been a part of a couple U.S. World Cup teams. Where were you based in, in your couple World Cups that you played? And how important was that city? And did you see it being a very vibrant part of the city that, uh, you know, that American tourists were hanging around there? So my first World Cup in 2006 was our base camp was in Hamburg. Okay. And the city, I mean, Germany did an unbelievable job at hosting that World Cup. Hamburg was phenomenal. Uh, the city, the country lit up for that World Cup. Everybody was hospitable, accommodating, nice, friendly, accessible. Um, families were unbelievably well welcomed. It, it was a great experience for everybody. There, I don't think there's anybody that could come away from the Germany experience uh, with anything negative. And the same for South Africa. It was a different kind of mechanism, right? You're not in Europe, you're in Africa. And I think some people had apprehensions with safety uh, before the World Cup. But then once you were there, it was like, there was no issues whatsoever. Um, everybody was mingling, interacting. Uh, the country took the, the, the proper steps, obviously, to secure the security of uh, all the participants, their families, the fans, et cetera. So at uh, base camp, as Terry was explaining, it was for us, wherever we were was, that was our hotel. That was our home for a month, a month and some change, right? And so um, regardless of what city we played a game in, like all of our stuff, our property was at that base camp. So we'd always come back to that in between games. And um, you had to be comfortable there. Um, we knew the, the staff at the hotel, they were comfortable with us because we were staying there for a month and some change, right? So, um, it's- it, And you it, got the sense, you got the sense that it, it added a certain vibrance to the city where you were base camped at. Well, you know? for sure, for sure, yeah. for sure. Any city that's hosting either games, base camps, uh, fan, fan fairs, all that stuff, the city has to take part. They have to be uh, active within it, you know? Um, and you could definitely tell that um, maybe not so much for the players because we're isolated in a bubble. So we can't just freely go off and do what we want. You know, we have to do our job and work, but for the families and the fans, they, they're definitely um, it, it's for them, right? The experience is more so for them to, to experience what a world cup is like. And a world cup is so much more than the games. <laughs> the games are a big part of it, but it's, literally everything around the games it's the it's the parties it's the viewing parties it's the it's the fans getting together and 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 from different countries and celebrating it's like everybody's everyone's best friend there's no strangers during a world cup right and, and that's what makes it so special gary you got time for a couple more from you and then i'll finish it off with a yeah, couple we really of, appreciate everybody's time 
Absolutely. It's a fascinating topic. conversation. Yeah. Absolutely. So my final question really, Stan, because I know we're running up against it a little, really yeah. either for either Boomi or Terry, certainly Aguchi could chime in as well. But, you know, uh, Terry, especially, you know, you've been at, you know, as you documented earlier, you've been at this a long time. You go all the way back to what, 09. We're talking, you know, more than a decade at this point in time after <laughs> energy, right? It's amazing. Yeah. Um, and we're still six years away, uh, five, or, you know, five, five years away. Yeah. But my question is, after all the time and effort, what's next? G give us a little bit of yeah. an idea of next steps, timing, when the decisions are made, what the next few months are going to be like. Well, the, the, the timing is, this, the timing of this conversation is impeccable because, you know, um, over the next uh, 90 to 120 days, we're orchestrating, um, hopefully, the FIFA delegation coming to Baltimore you know, letting us put on a, a site visit um, to show them the, the inner workings of our stadium, show them the inner backdrop of the city of Baltimore and the, you know, the dynamic can do, you know, demeanor that I, I, I share with you know, anybody who talks about, you know, Baltimore and the state of Maryland. So hosting a site visit sometime probably mid second quarter of 2021 with decision day on who's going to host matches in late 2021. So 21 is a huge year for this process. Um, but you know what? It's not over in 21. You know, like I said, when we get matches, you know, that's when, you know, the really, you know, heavy lifting, you know, using the two gentlemen that are on the call with me and making sure that everything that we have laid out to get us to this point then is in a platform to then be to, in an executional standpoint. We then have to, you know, which we're building the team right now with transportation and operations and logistics and public safety and, you know, egress and regress from the various venues that we're recommending. You know, we also are recommending some venues that still need to be potentially developed, you know, working with, you know, Baltimore City Park and Rec on some of their strategic plans and some of the things that they're wanting to do to help some of their community centers become more vibrant centers long term for the city of Baltimore using the World Cup platform helps them deliver the project maybe in an earlier time frame and gives us the field and the training site capabilities that we need to make sure that folks like Gucci and others have great experiences when they're here to train and participate in, in matches here. So the end of 21 means that we really get to work about executing on all of the visioning and all of the strategies that we're putting into place as we currently speak that we're sharing with people in US soccer and that we're getting these guys and other folks like the Lieutenant Governor and others really jazzed up about because it can change the narrative. It's the only sporting event in the world that can touch every corner of the city and the region around Baltimore. There's no other sporting event out there in the world that can go into you know, West Baltimore, or East Baltimore or South Baltimore or, or the Pimlico um, neighborhoods and the like and have an impact. The World Cup can help us do that. And if we use the right strategies that we're laying out with the host committee and our partners across the city, you know, we are setting up the tides for what future activities look like when they choose Baltimore. And we're setting the stage for something that's really big. And I'm hoping and working hard with our team and our partners to ensure that the game plan is solid and we're executing just like the Ravens are going to execute this weekend against Tennessee. Our game plan is going to be on a card and we're going to say, if we do X, we get Y and so-and-so will move here and we're going to go up the middle and we're going to score. Um, so we're using that type of mentality as how we're putting the host community together and how we're working the logistics of that. And it takes solid people who understand the various components of this. It's not one person. It's not Terry Hasseltine by no stretch. It's Gucci, it's Boomy, it's the Lieutenant Governor, it's, you know, uh, Wedding Turner and bg and &E and others all stepping up to play a role in this. It's Press Box, it's you guys helping us storyline some things so we can do and tell the story so that the footprint and the legacy of this thing is far beyond just hosting the World Cup. One thing, though, Terry, about the game Sunday, uh, the Ravens are favored in that game, and Boomy said he likes an underdog. You know, so we're not the underdog in that game. Boom, boom, well, I guess to... you're not underdogs anymore when it comes to uh, American <laughs> football. Well, that fits in nicely with my last question for you. And then I got one more for Terry is you seem to be plugged into this, this soccer world in a, in a certain way. 
how do you think this bid is going? How is it going for Baltimore, Maryland? For Baltimore, yeah. Oh, um, I think it's going well. I think it's time for um, the for us in the community to ramp up the support. Um, I think there's a couple of uh, there, there still um, lies some some corporations in the community that don't understand um, that haven't wrapped their arms around the World Cup in 2026. A lot of people are thinking, "Oh, it's 2026. That's a long way." Yeah. you know to go however you know if you look at the road to 2026 you know should we get it um we have five years from uh, from 2021 to promote it till 2026 so you have you can there's a lot of economic impact that could be realized on a f five year uh window you know then when it comes to 2026 it's, you know, it's just for that month, you know, so a lot, I need, a, I need companies and, uh, and the community to understand that, that, you know, this is, this is, this is a major deal. If, you know, the last time the World Cup came to the U.S. was in, uh, was in 94, you know, right. you do, you do the math, you know, 20, and 26 now, years, now, yeah. yeah, so now we have a, 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 a once in a lifetime opportunity that, um, Baltimore, Maryland was even considered, you know, uh, to be shortlisted in the race, you know, so uh, a, a lot of people the, in, in, in Baltimore shouldn't, they should, they, they should stand up and, and really look at this as, hey, you know, how, how, how can we be, how can we be down? How can we help, you know? Yeah. I thank you, Boomy. I appreciate it. Terry, one more or two more real quick things. Number one, the pandemic of the last 10 months. How has that complicated this bid? Uh, or have things like Zoom technology just made it sort of seamless that not actually getting together with people directly hasn't been an issue? There's, there's, there's two factors there. One, it, it's just changed the dynamic of what's supposed to happen in person. Uh, you know, schedules have been shifted, timelines have been shifted to a degree. But I think the the really awesome part, if there's an awesomeness that you can put on something like a pandemic, you know, the silver lining, let's use that word, is that our communication, our thoughtfulness about how we approach and how we go after certain aspects of this thing, I think because we've been able to reset and, and, and slow a little bit, it's allowed us to deep dig and deep diver into a lot of conversations, you know, with association that Gucci's involved with, you know, football, you know, for peace, you know, working with them on a strategy about how do we use, you know, the game as some diplomatic um, diplomacy, you know, and, and bring teams over from other countries and that might not get a chance to square up against one another because there's issues within, within their borders, but we can bring them here and, you know, do a peaceful, you know, you know, you know, play through the game and expose and bring the, you know, the embassies from DC up and be able to do some things like that, but also too to give you know the young athletes uh, across the globe a chance to maybe experience something that hasn't been exposed before. Bringing kids over from Africa to play, you know, in some of our clubs and some of our programs and exchange programs and sending some of our athletes over there, you know, so we can use this as an educational tool too. Yeah. So it's it's allowed us to be more thoughtful about our approach on our legacy approach on defining some things as we think. They need to move forward in order to keep people really engaged with us and the soccer community globally engaged. So it's really created a more thoughtful approach to doing this. We're not running at a thousand miles an hour trying to get to the next outcome. My last question is, Terry, I know your, your issue is bringing games here and putting people in seats and all that and making money for the state of Maryland. Beyond the World Cup is... Are there economic development opportunities that come from the World Cup that aren't necessarily directly tied to the games? And I'm talking about some of the stuff I was reading about the African nations that, you know, that possibly they're going to look to uh, the state of Maryland as a place that they can do commerce with. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, one of the things that we've been working closely with, with Boomi on is, 
some of those diplomatic relationships, um, import and exporting opportunities, Maryland products to, you know, other nations, um, importing, you know, you know, different products that might not be making their way and creating those diplomatic relationships so that we can ease commerce, you know, you know, in and out of the, the state of Maryland. I think it also has opened our door, you know, because people are now seeing Baltimore on, you know, a roster of significance. And so other companies and other organizations across the globe are going, hey, they're in the World Cup. They got to be pretty significant players in the, the global market if they're going to be, you know, doing something of this significance. So, it's a door opener on some conversations that we probably haven't had because the exposure of a major international event like the World Cup has not been, we haven't been on the roster. You know, you can't play the game if you're not on the roster. And so Gucci knows that better. If you're not on the roster, you're not going in the game. Um, so this has created a roster spot for us, you know, both domestically and internationally to do things in commerce, tourism, you, you name an industry, it, it's a door opener. All right. I thank Aguchi Anweyu, Bumi Janadu, and Terry Hazeltine. As events warrant, over the next four or five months, maybe we'll bring this panel back together again for another one of these Zoom visits to discuss the Maryland bid for 2026. I'll be on Monday night with Ross Grimsley. We'll have Ben McDonald, former Oriel pitcher, on with us. For Gary Stein and Stan, I'm Stan the Fan Charles. We're out of here. Take it. And thank you guys very much for tonight. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Appreciate it. Thanks, you.